What if you could step back in time and talk with some of Kansas City's most historic figures? The innovators and achievers who left their mark on our town, on our nation. What would you ask if you could meet the past? This week, Crosby cozies up with Annie Chambers, Casey's most famous madam. Born Leanna Lovell, Chambers City Market Brothel catered to the city's burgeoning population at the turn of the century. Tonight, I'd like to bring you back 140 years, almost to the day, Kansas City in 1869, the Annus Mirabilis of Kansas City, the Hannibal Bridge is built. The Board of Trade starts to trade grain in 1869. The Kansas City Stockyards are founded in 1869 by Charles Francis Adams, grandson and great-grandson of presidents. And from Kentucky and Indiana, Annie Chambers arrived to establish her first house. Ladies and gentlemen, the woman who gave more pleasure to more men, men <laughs> than anyone in Kansas City history, Annie Chambers. First time we've had a bustle and a corset up here. Um, <laughs> Annie, I, I'd like to take you back. I'd like to take you back to, uh, to Sullivan, Indiana, uh -huh. uh, to your late teenage years, and to a moment that may have have created your career. Uh, there's a parade. Oh. It's the 1860 election. Abraham Lincoln is running for president, and your father is a Democrat. Oh, yes. Well, he came from Kentucky. You know, it was a slave state. And uh, he didn't much care for Mr. Lincoln. Mr. Lincoln was coming through Sullivan for a campaign stop, and there was going to be a big parade for him. Some friends of mine and I decided we wanted to go ride in this parade. So we, we met ourselves some lovely yellow riding habits and I, I stole my mother's saddle that day and we went and we rode in this parade. It was just for luck. You know, we didn't much care about the politics of it all. We just wanted to be seen. And you were by but your we father. we were seen. <laughs> oh. uh -oh. My daddy saw me. Uh, we rode right, right, right past his hotel and oh, he was teeth rattling and mad at me when I got home. He threw so, you out of the house. Well, he didn't exactly throw me out of the house, but he did tell me to go live with my aunt in another town. So you, you, go, you go off to this other town where your aunt lives, mm -hmm. and you become a school teacher. You have some independence, independence from your family. You have a job. <laughs> you come back to Sullivan, and, and you're a school teacher there. Mm -hmm. And you, you meet a man. Unless a woman was married, she really didn't have a place in the world. You, you had only a, a few options. And your entire position, your, all your security, all, it, re, it relied ent entirely upon your husband or your, your father. I was, I was getting older. I was 20 years old. I was practically a spinster. Uh, Willie Chambers came. He's a railroad man. And uh, he took a liking to me. And my father liked him. And, and it seems that your life is, is, is good. You have Willie Chambers as your yeah. husband. He's got a good job with the, with the railroad. And, and you're, you've lost a child uh, after, after a year, but you're pregnant again. And Willie sends you out in the, to, to, to ride in the, in the buggy, and, and tragedy strikes. Yes, well, I, I had lost my first child, and I set the world by that, that little boy. But uh, I had another one coming, so he had my brother give me buggy rides every day for my health. And one day, a, a red-winged blackbird scooted out of the bushes there and spooked the horses. And the horses went careening all over, and um, I got thrown into the, a ditch alongside the road. Didn't wake up for three days, they tell me. But when I did wake up, they told me that my second baby had been born, but he'd been born dead. And they told me that my father's hotel uh, that he had bought, um, he had lost that. So the family was was in dire straits, and then. And then they also told me in the same three days that I'd been sleeping, my husband had uh, fallen from a railroad trestle under construction, and he also was dead. Annie, that is an extraordinary series of, of tragedies, and, and here you are in Sullivan, in Indiana, and so you, you decided to go to Indianapolis? Well, I had a letter from a friend of mine, Poppy, 
she rode with me in that parade. Um, she'd gone on to Indi Indianapolis and worked for millinery, and that was an awful thing. It, they, they had him locked in his little attic and fed him nothing but oatmeal every day and worked him 20 hours out every day for just four dollars a week. And then they took half of that back. There are not many, many jobs at, at, no, at this point in American history, the 1860s, that are available to a woman who wants to live outside of her family no. as an independent woman. You could be in retail and millinery or, or even, no, domestic you service. You couldn't work in a store. You could own one, but you couldn't work in it. You, could, you couldn't even be a nurse. That wasn't respectable yet. And, and, and you teaching. pretty much have to be a spinster to be a teacher. Well, you have to be certifiably virginal. <laughs> The very idea of taking care of other people's children after I had lost two of my own, I, I, was, I couldn't face that. So I, my friend Poppy, she had written me, but while she was working at this millinery, this very elegant woman came in with these two very young, elegant women. She told Poppy, she said, if you ever get tired of working so hard for so little, you come see me at my resort. Resort? <laughs> now that, that has an interesting connotation today. Resort, what did resort mean? In well, you're 1860. Basic house of Ill Fame. House of Ill Fame, a sporting house. Okay, yes. so you, you, you go to Indianapolis and I arrive in I was Indianapolis. Going to go, yes. And well, I got in a cab and told the, the, the heck to, to take me to the, the best sporting house in town. Good golly. <laughs> so it, it wasn't a, a bad life for, for you. You were an, in, an independent woman. Did, did you find love? Did you. Uh, w w did you harden yourself to uh, this life? Well, when I first got there, you know, I was half crazed uh, from grief and so forth. I, I determined I was going to probably have a short life, but a fast and merry one. <laughs> I lived my life in this sort of haze of, of brandy and, and drugs and sex, and I, just, uh, I lived it fast. I tried to fling it away. But at some point, you decided you didn't want to work for someone else. You wanted to work for yourself, and you, and you, and you lit out for the territory, so to speak. You, you went from Indianapolis to Kansas City with one of your, with one of your friends. What, why Kansas City? I knew I had to leave Indianapolis. I had made the, the fateful error of falling in love with one of my customers, who happened to be married, man. We have several children, and um, one of the gals that um, that was living with me at the time. She'd just come back from Kansas City, and she said that they, uh, it was good time. It was a lot of opportunity. And um, growing place, and I thought, well, why not? Kansas City, 1865, 6,000 people. 1868, 12,000 people. 16,000 people in 1870. What did you find in Kansas City? Did you, did you immediately go into business? Well, yes, I, I uh, immediately rented a house down on the levee, but um, one down of my... Down where the railroads were coming in? Yes, and uh, one of my uh, regulars, a prosperous gentleman in town, he suggested I should move uptown. And I just had a little hurrah house down there, so... Um, hurrah I, house, where I, the sporting girls are. <laughs> yes, go ahead, yes. So I got myself a little cottage uh, at 3rd and Wyandotte, and uh, that was uh, $30 a month. And then the landlord found out what I was doing for a living and raised it up to $50 a month. But you were, you were very successful, oh, so you expanded. I did. I expanded. I took the, the cottage next door as well, and I attached it with a, a little walkway, hallway. And then it went up to 100 bucks a month. And, um, and then I just tore the, the both of them down and built a 24-room mansion. A $100,000 house in 1872, right. probably the most expensive building built in Kansas and City. And I paid it off in two years, I'll have you know. <laughs> Which leads to the fact that your house was something a little bit different than these hurrah houses and, and uh, crib girl houses uh, oh. the, of, the, of the early days of this kind of fun in Kansas City. You really were a resort, uh, as, as, as you called it, a resort house that were the fille de joie. Mm -hmm. you, it had sort of a French flavor to, uh, very high to class. what you did. Very high class, indeed. I taught my girls manners, and I cultivated their interests in various things so they could have good conversation with, with the gentlemen. But they were very attractive, too. I taught them how to do their hair and all the latest styles. Like this one, you like this one? Very lovely, Thank yes, abso absolutely. And I took them to the best dressmakers in town. We had to have the dresses specially altered because, in case you hadn't noticed, these things are very difficult to get into and out of. <laughs> so we had them 
altered so they'd be easy to get in and out of because I absolutely would not I, have my girls. I wouldn't know, by the way, but go, go ahead. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I wouldn't have them lying about the parlor on negligee. You know, that, that was tacky. And you had the best of food and, and wine and, and, uh, and music. There was music in your We only your served house. wine and beer, though. We never served hard liquor in my establishment. What could uh, a girl make in a, a night at your establishment? Well, a good night. She could make $200 or so. She could keep dollar. half of that. $200 in today's money is uh, She had a good life in, in, my, in, uh, in my establishment, and I encouraged them to save their money and, and build a nest egg so that when they left, they'd have, have something... So, something to go on. So these girls are coming from the country and, 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 and from out of town to the, to the big city, but you really were their protector. You, you, you guarded them and helped them, helped them to careers later on and, and marriage. I helped them to husbands later on as well. Husbands. Well, over half of my girls married and married well, right, at, right out of the, the house where they, they found them. It's extraordinary to me, and I have, I have here from the Missouri Valley Room, the special collections. Actually, this is from the very special collections of the Kansas City Public Library from 1905. And this includes, I think, some of your girls. <laughs> the photograph, album, and directory, the little red book, <laughs> which was not available in any bookstore. <laughs> And inside you can find sometimes calling cards uh, of young ladies with telephone numbers and addresses, and sometimes pictures. There's Flo Beach. How did the police and the prosecutors, the justice system of Kansas City, how did this happen? Well, I couldn't have done what I did without friends. <laughs> In, a, in addition I, I to, to my prosperous men. I understand Third and then. Wyandotte was only about two blocks from City Hall and from police headquarters. Yeah, but yes, about that. Had a buzzer at one point after built the new house. Had a buzzer underneath the stairs, direct line. To, to the, the police, police department? Station. Yes, no absolutely. Kidding. So if something happened, somebody got on rule, I just pushed that buzzer. And, and I've heard there was something called the fine system. That's right, that's right. And I, how did that work? Well, I would pay a fine. I would pay a $30 fine every month for running a disorderly house. And then I would pay a $20 fine for selling uh, wine and beer. This, this is the period when Carrie Nation comes out of Kansas into Missouri and tries to close the saloons and the body houses. She apparently was arrested for blocking the road in front of your establishment and fined... <laughs> And Carrie Nation was fined $500, and the judge said, Missouri is not a good place for short-haired women, long-haired men, and whistling girls. You may smash saloons in Kansas and raise all kinds of trouble there, but you must observe the law here. Kansas City is a law-abiding city. So... The fine system worked pretty well. Yes, it did. Now, how did you attract uh, men to your house? I mean, maybe that's obvious, but, but when you showed up in Kansas City, I understand you, you had a unique way of, of, of bringing your first group of customers in. You went to a party that a, that a, a fellow madam... I did. Molly Smart, she had a party, and only nine people showed up. Can you imagine? How humiliating. I thought I could do better. So I sent out invitations. I had them printed up and sent them out to all the business offices. Wait, of wait you sent invitations out to businessmen yes. to come to a body house? Absolutely. I sent them to their offices, not their homes. Mark well, them personal. Uh, that, <laughs> that, now I understand. It makes some sense, yes. And, and so how many, how many of these men showed up? 108. <laughs> Good golly. You're going along in this wonderful world in which you're respected by, uh, by, by business people and you have a good relationship with the city, the police, and you get married again. And, and, and tell me, what, how, how old were you at that point and how old was he? Billy Kearns was 36 years old and I was 52. What? There you go. Well, Thank you. exactly. This is, this is quite a reversal from your, from your first marriage, Willie Chambers, who was 40 years old when you were 20 years old. It's so. quite a reversal for just about everybody. In those days, men could marry younger women, sure, but uh, women, older women, they never married younger men. That was just not done. Yeah. But now, I figured, you know, I, I had the money, I had the guts, and I had the man, so why not? Absolutely, absolutely. Billy Kearns was a gambler. Oh, he, yes. 
he, he really yeah, wasn't. He was a, a good for nothing, actually. It was he. He was a good-looking man. He was very nicely turned out, well manicured, clean shaven, and he, it was funny. It made me laugh. And over the years, I'd had my share of of what I'd call loving friends, special special friends. I suppose I, I was just starting to feel my age and starting to feel like I didn't want to die alone. So I married him. I married him right before my birthday in 1895. And he'd come to me over the years and ask for money whenever he went bust at the tables. And then one, one time, along about the turn of the century, when life was changing, you know, and the progressives, they were getting all geared up to come after me. And um, he thought, well, maybe we should invest in a different kind of business just in case they shut us down. And we had met this man in Cincinnati who, who sold phonographs and electric pianos, that sort of thing. He wanted me to give him $18,000 to invest in this business. Oh, so you invested in his business. In his how business, did, yes. How did that work out? Well, he had to go off to Cincinnati, and uh, I'd visit him a couple of times. But uh, this one time, I, I went to visit him. And he had taken rooms for me at a hotel instead of having me to his house. And um, he said it was because it was messy. But I knew it was because it was it's a little woman. suspicious, yeah. Yeah, and she was 25 years old. Ouch! And by this time I was 62, so I told them I was writing them off as a bad investment. But you know, it, it, things begin to change in 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 the world of late late Victorian America. And Kansas endorses prohibition. And women's suffrage comes. Mm -hmm. And Jane Addams, a great reformer, says no, no great wrong has ever risen more clearly to social consciousness of a generation than that of commercialized vice. These things are, are, are coming to Kansas City. And oh, they're all done? so progressive, these ideas. I mean, you, you can pass laws. You can close the body houses down. You can smash the stills with big axe hammers. But you're never going to get people to stop drinking. You're never going to get them to stop smoking or doing drugs if they can get a hold of it. And you are damn sure never going to get them to have, stop having sex. <laughs> These are things that take the pain away. There's a good deal of pain in life. All you do when you make laws like that is you make it harder and less safe for them to do it. Thank, Thank you. you. So, but, but still, they're trying to suppress vice. Their vice commissions were established in Kansas City. We're, mm -hmm. getting, we're getting to 1910, 1912, 1913, and, and they want to suppress uh, what you do for, mm -hmm. for, for a living. And so in November of 1913, there's a, a great moment where you go before this vice commission and you testify. What did you tell them? Uh, they, they had segregated us, you know, they, that's how they began it. First they were going to segregate us into the red light district, just keep us in one spot where they could control things, but we could keep them in business. And then they were planning to, to close the body houses altogether. And I told them if they closed down the district, then all the women that, that lived there and worked there, they're going to get scattered to all corners of the city where, where the, there was no control. They, no protection. No protection. Spread these they girls go out. ahead, they keep working, but there'd be no control over what they were doing. Besides which, they're going about it the wrong way. They're going it from the back end. They're, they're trying to, to punish girls after they've already fallen. And, and it would be better to, to keep them from falling in the first place, to keep them from getting to a point when, when the families have discarded them and the church won't take them in and the, and the society has kicked them in the shin so much and they, they have nowhere else to go but to a haven, a last resort like mine. You told those commissioners uh, as they were hemming and hawing, I think, that that the churches themselves came to you and, and, and asked for your support, which you gave to them regularly. You were very, very charitable. And that there was even a society of 3,500 women, a women's organization that supported your view. Absolutely. I told them 90% of the people in Kansas City, they supported segregation. Because I thought, you know, my, my figures might have been just a little bit fudged. But I'm only, I mainly just wanted those, those do-gooders to understand that it, they might be anti-vice and they might be yelling the loudest, but they were not necessarily the majority. It is interesting that this is the, as the Pendergast era uh, begins, that, that uh, there is all this suppression of vice because there are, there are these other things happening, such as the Chesterfield Club, where the... the <laughs> Your, your ladies were beautifully dressed into the Chesterfield Club. They didn't wear any clothes at all, except I understand they were required to wear shoes. <laughs> but it was the flapper era. We were getting oh, into the flapper era the now. Flappers were just giving sex away, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and it's interesting, the difference between the Chesterfield Club and my, my establishment. It's interesting, the, the differences between the way men 
control bus and the way women control bus. I think you're right. There was a certain refinement to what you did that's lacking in when men get control. But you know, you, you as an independent woman were extraordinary. You decided to challenge this suppression of your business and you actually went to the Supreme Court of the mm -hmm. state of Missouri. And I've got to say, uh, as a believer in strict construction, I, I am an admirer of the Supreme Court of the state of Missouri, which after this worked its way through in the teens, I think about 1921, they came down with a decision in which they said, and I quote, keeping a body house is not a public nuisance in any sense of the word. They, they decided they'd just redefine public nuisance until they got something that the Supreme Court was, was obliged to, mm. to, uh, uh, to acknowledge. And, and so you spent the next eight years in and, out of, in and out of business. I kept fighting. Eventually then in February 22, 1922, is uh, when I had to close up shop for good. You, you turned your house into something of a boarding house. Some of those, some of those railroad men who maybe having advanced in years had been your customers in one sense or now, now are customers in another <laughs> sense. sense. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It was a respectable boarding house for railroad men. Occasionally there'd be a big storm or something. I'd have Murray Darling, my, my house man, he'd go let the, the homeless men in until the rain stopped. Never stopped worrying about those unfortunates. Even the, the boarding house business became a, a, a trial after well, I, I broke my hip at one point. I, I was pretty old at that point, and I broke my hip and couldn't get around very well. And it occurred to me that I could open my house. You, you were a legend by this time. I was. You were and, a legend. And people in wanted Kansas to know City. what happened. Your story That's was right. worth telling. These young couples, you know, they'd go slumming down in the red light district, and they want to know what what went on there. So I'd open my house. They go walk around in my house, poke their noses in all the bedrooms and that sort of thing. And they come down to the parlor where I was sitting there in my, my cane wheelchair and I'd tell them my stories. I was never very ashamed of, of what I did in my business, although people thought I should be. I, uh, I count some of the, the finest, most prosperous men in town amongst my friends. And most of my girls went on to, to good lives, very respectable lives, married lives. and and. They write letters to me. Send flowers. You were surrounded by flowers oh, yeah, that they had a uh, those girls who were <laughs> now women with careers or hu yeah. husbands would send you. Pretty soon, a man named Reverend David Bulkley uh, moved in man. next door. A World War One veteran who mm -hmm. founded the City Union Mission That's is right. your next door neighbor. Well, he bought Madame Lovejoy's place, which uh, backed up to mine. Though Madame our Lovejoy were very becomes close. the City Union Mission, <laughs> only in Kansas City. He opened it as a, as a haven for, for homeless men, and he called it the harbor. And then about, oh, when was it, 24 or so, I guess, uh, I was still, I was running my boarding house, and I was sitting by the windows in the back, and uh, I heard Reverend Bulkley preaching a sermon over in the, in the harbor. And he, he was preaching a sermon for a dead baby. He put me in mind of my own babies that I lost, of course. And you hadn't even heard a sermon since you left... No, God and I Sullivan. weren't on speaking terms for a great many years. <laughs> but uh, there was something about this sermon that really touched my heart. Then one night in 33, a still blew up a couple blocks away. It was a big explosion, and everybody was out on the street watching this fire that resulted. And, and I found myself standing right next to Beulah Bulkley, his wife. And, and we got talking, and um, I told her I'd been watching all the good works that they've been doing over there and, and that I would very, very much like to be their friend. <laughs> well, they're good people, so they, they were delighted. And they became dear friends of mine and they looked after me because I was pretty darn old at that point. And um, <laughs> they brought me meals and they'd read the Bible to me because my eyes, I couldn't see light from dark at that point. And um, they prayed with me. So I guess you could say that um, that towards the end, God and I, we, we came to an understanding. You had a conversion experience. Yes, and, and, and so I Annie, did. here is Annie Chambers, the great madam of, of Kansas City, the, the, the leading purveyor of vice, and you've come to come to God, come to Jesus at the at the at the end of your life with Better this late uh, than never, I suppose. Re Reverend Bulkley. <laughs> and and the City Union mission benefited from from that enormously. Well, I, I knew I was getting on, stay. so I changed my will and, and I left everything I had, my state, my house to the City Union Mission to continue the good works that they do.
March 24th, 1935, you die, and, and at your funeral, there were the well-dressed men, there were the men from the mission, and girls from all walks of life, some of your friends and the girls who worked for you. But you know, your, your real legacy is that you were the most important independent woman in Kansas City until Nellie Don. Nell Donnelly Reed, and you brought pleasure and a little refinement and maybe even a little enlightenment to Kansas City. I like to think so. So I'd like to thank you, Annie Chambers, for being with us My here pleasure. tonight. My pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, Annie Chambers. Everybody uh, interested in the story of the, the great infamous madam of, of Kansas City. So it was a real treat to be able to play her. There's no footage or anything like that. So I was able to create a, a character that I felt was my own from what I'd read and, and what I would imagine her to be. And um, I just had a really good time with this one. <laughs> she was fun. To learn more about Annie Chambers, Reading lists and more can be found at the Kansas City Public Library or at kclibrary.org.